You're tuned in to RX Radio. Do so you know what I realized the other day? Is that people are recording clips of themselves talking like they're talking on a podcast, hmm. but not on a podcast. That kind of blew my mind. Sounds inefficient. It's like the podcast, it's if you have long form, you have short form. If you have short form, you don't have long form. Yeah, but it's so telling of the industry, right? Like this is where we're at. We're pretending to have podcasts, right? Like you're, you're getting this, you're getting mics that like don't even work, and you're just using like a top mounted boom mic, and it's it's just like can can it be any more fake that this is where you can't even talk for an hour, forty five minutes, thirty minutes. Trust I me, know great it will get more fake. No, how? How? <laughs> oh, dude. I have faith that it will get more fake. I don't know how. I don't know how it's gotten this fake. It's just like, oh, the the fucking... You know what I saw the other day that I thought was wild? Uh, And I've heard of this before. Friends at Mind Pump put us onto this. Um, That Huberman posted this thing that companies are using AGI of like his voice and image to make it look like he's personally endorsing shit. Yeah, I've seen this. It's fucking wild and it's good. Is it? That's terrifying. Yeah, AI is terrifying. I'm also a little bit offended that we have it, that no one's like, hey, hey, you know, like we're not like, all right, I'm right we've got, here. We've got hours archived. I'll write the 500 episodes, actual real ones, real episodes, not yeah. little fake clips. You got to get the whole thing. That's when you a get a phone call of, of us trying to sell you life insurance, you know, we've made it. Or we've settled for our fate and it's actually <laughs> us. Or we're just like, More yeah, probable. Look, look, you know, we should use like a safety word. Like you know it's you know it's us. We won't tell. We won't tell the AGI. It won't. It won't know that it's. Yeah, I, I, I thought that was. And I, there was one ad that was going around that was like, it was made to look like it was in Rogan's studio, but it wasn't. That's like wild. you know he's got like whatever like a curtain that like behind the back of people, and it's like very quintessential. Like, oh, that's a Rogan set. Uh, this guy, it just wasn't. He just like found the same kind of looking curtain but he's like never been a guest on the show people go to such lengths to fake shit like it's probably Dude. easier to actually build a business that works than is the effort that people are putting in to look like they have a business that works i just couldn't deal with like the other shoe dropping like, i just couldn't deal with that like looking over your shoulder and like and maybe it doesn't matter or maybe they're sociopaths and it doesn't matter to them but i'd like just fundamentally couldn't live my life like not having the stuff that I have and doing the things that I do like that to me would be insane. Yeah. Yeah. Just being really bad at one thing instead of, or multiple things. Cause it's probably going to fail and they're going to be really bad at the next thing. As opposed to just trying to be really good at one thing. And here's the kicker. You don't even have to be really good. Yeah. You have to be marginally better. And I think that's where a lot of people go wrong. It's like, you just have to try. And you know, I think, I hope, I hope people know when they're trying. Like the feeling, there's a feeling that you get. And I don't know how to describe it to people who've never had it, but it's, it's almost like trying to describe a color. It's like, you know, when you're not trying, maybe it's like a better proxy. Like, you know, there's this little like, ah, oh, right. you stupid bitch. Like, hmm, hmm, that. And that's all you do. If you can live every day without that thing creeping up into the stuff you do, man, you're going to you're gonna not suck enough to be okay. See, you're spoken as a person with initiative, though. So many people are so fucking lazy that they don't want to actually try trying. You illuminated this point to me years ago, and it, it's probably a weekly thought. We were talking about something on the podcast, and you said something to the effect of like, yo, yeah, dude, let me stop you you're assuming that people actually want to get better. And I'm like, wait, I thought that was just like a precondition to not dying. And you're like, no, <laughs> no, sir, not at all. Most people are just autopilot. Yeah, there's some pieces of shit out there. Plenty of them. Wild, 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 wild stuff, man. Yeah, so welcome to a real podcast with real people for now. And <laughs> as this podcast continues to grow, we're in the early 500s of our, uh, our episode archive library. As we become more successful, we made a promise to you, our loyal listeners, that we will talk infinitely more shit. You know those memes that go around that go, 
if I won the lottery, I wouldn't tell anyone, with, but there would be clues. <laughs> if the business continues to scale and in you know however long it takes to get where we want to go with the things that we're trying to do, which we'll discuss very shortly, uh, we won't tell anyone, but there will be clues. And the first clue will be me and Jenta going through other podcast titles and ripping the living <sighs> piss out of them. It's going to be so unhinged. So oh. unhinged. I have so many thoughts that I can't share with anyone because they're irreprehensible. Like people would just not forgive me. And I can't wait to share them with everyone that's listening right now. There is a dollar figure where that doesn't matter, which I love. Yeah. Yeah. Those of you. So it's the gambler, right? Is that the movie? I have no idea. So we refer to often in sidebar conversations in the privacy of our own homes, Jordan and I, now I'm going to air it out to the entire internet. We refer to a point in our lives where maybe, just maybe, we end up with what's called fuck you money. Mm, and yes. now I believe this concept was first on my doorstep, first on my doorstep from a movie called, I think it was called The Gambler. It was Mark Wahlberg, who was like an English professor with a gambling problem. And John Goodman was like some guy in the gambling house that was kind of in that underground gambling world. And he's like, that's what you want. You want to get to fuck you money. Or if someone comes up, you have a problem with it, you say, fuck you. You got the house on the hill. You got $2 million in the bank. You live off the interest and no one can that. And we, you know, and I'm going to do the thing that everyone always like, oh, if I won the lottery, I would quit my job the next day. It's like, eh, I like my job. I like what we do. Yeah. Uh, but the, the telltale sign wouldn't be that we quit our jobs. <laughs> it would be that we just talk irreprehensible irre- shit about it. Right now, it's, and the thing is, you don't know who it is. If you're listening, it could be you. Maybe it is. Maybe you're a little bit uncomfortable. Like, oh, shit. Maybe shallow feels the type of way. But now, if you're listening to us and have religiously, it's probably not you, but maybe. Could be. Stick around, stick around and find out. But if you think that it's not you and you want to help us out, we are <laughs> attempting to do something that, I mean, I can't even say very few people in the industry have done because I don't even know the people behind the project that we are undertaking who have undertaken this project before if that makes sense we are the first founder-led company to do the thing we are going to do and in order to do that and we can explain a little bit about what that is once you accept the mission uh, and by accepting the mission it means going to my instagram story at the underscore muscle underscore doc um, or if the story has since expired dm me and i will Take your email address, and we will send you an email. And inside this email, it'll have two links. Intrigued? Good, you should. And these two links are going to be pivotal in changing the course of the fitness industry forever. Do you accept? Head on over to at the underscore muscle underscore doc. If it is May 29th, Wednesday, 24 hours therein, there will be a question and answer box on my story, and only a question and answer box on my story. Put your email address there. And you will be a part of this super secret mission to change the fitness industry forever. And I can guarantee you, if Jay and I ever strike big and win the lottery, we won't talk shit about you and those that you love. How's that? How's that for a sales pitch? That was great. Very mysterious. I'm not going to make the same promise, though. Anyone can get it. Anyone can fucking get it. <laughs> you catch it. You catch it. You jump in front of the bullet, dog. That's you. <laughs> Okay. You know, I, how, what kind of friend would I be if, if I held back just because he gave me an email? I That's appreciate fair. the help and we need you. We very much do need you. And I appreciate you for helping us. But, but step on the line, you can get it. Trust me. This is what, this is what getting it for 13 years. Like. <laughs> I'm so this sorry. Is, I'm so sorry. I've been catching it. Your boy likes, your boy likes a beating. Um, <laughs> all right. So that's the mission. Can't tell you what it is. It's on some super secret shit, but we don't really ask for much. You know how I know this? Because we have a few sponsors to the podcast, and we barely ever talk about it. Shout out, Merrick Health. <laughs> I actually – shit, actual real talk. Real talk. Mike from Merrick Health. Smoky. Uh, no, uh, other Mike. Oh. Warner. Okay. Jacked. Jack, dude. He – I think – what is Smokey's real name? Fuck, I hate the internet. I'm sorry, Smoke. But Mike <laughs> – uh, actually reached out to me today. He's in the level one and he reached out and was like, yo man, it's been a minute since you've had bloods. Let's get some blood. So through Merrick health, I'm getting my bloods done when we're in Tampa Bay in uh, a few weeks for the L3 and dude, we're just business today. 
there is one, and I, I, I know people say this all the time, but legitimately, and those of you who follow our stories and follow the brand, you know this is actually true. There is one remaining spot. Someone in the second week of the L3 had to back out due to personal reasons. There is one available spot for the Prescript Level 3 course. So obviously, if you're a Level 2 coach and you're listening, it is from the 24th to the 29th or 30th of June in Tampa Bay, Florida. Every day runs from about 7 to 2.30. You are going to be on the gym floor with myself, my gorgeous colleague, Dr. Junta here, uh, Killian Hamilton. There's going to be uh, uh, James McIntosh, Jorge De Hoyas, and we are going to be training and putting into practice the principles that we've taught in Prescript off-season NFL athletes. I have the list. Insane. So if you've ever wondered what it's like to manage about a billion dollars under contract, Now's the time to step up, step up, show up. Don't worry. We're going to make sure you don't fuck up, but it teaches you to take your job seriously. Last time. Well, no, if you think about when the last time that you've trained a billion dollars worth of clients in a day, uh, hold on. Probably never changes things, changes things when, you know, we have, I'm not going to name names. I'm just going to name dollar figures in the last month or so. And if you're big on football, you're going to know who they are. Uh, $84 million, $73 million, $94 million in contract extensions. That's three guys. It's a lot of dollars. A lot of dollars. Yeah. Don't fuck up. But that's what this industry is all about, right? Don't fuck up. Back yourself. So L3, if you're interested in grabbing that last spot, info at pre com. Shoot us an email. If you will cross-reference, so don't no one try to sneak in without getting in L1 or L2. If you're an L2 coach, we'll cross-reference. Shoot us an email, grab that spot. We'll see you in Tampa. It'll be a lot of fun. Sick. Love it. Sick. You're you fired up it. today, man. I like this. You know what? It's I, I had a Mexican ice cube, man, and I really – I'm not – this is me running on pure sympathetic drive. To, like, if I talk faster, maybe I can get to the toilet quicker. Um, <laughs> it's So I'm just going to let the shit come out of my mouth today. I think it's going to be the big takeaway. <laughs> that's going to be – that's where that comes from. Uh, uh, yeah, so don't eat the ice cubes in Mexico. Uh, huge thank you to the One Fitness Weekend for having uh, Jorge and myself out there in Corretero. Not Curatero, like a, a gringo would say. Um, but Jorge and I just got back. And we uh, it was odd. We did our first tag team bilingual translation in person. It was it was Wow, fun. that's yeah. sick. One of the things that we don't that people don't know is we actually have the prescript level one manual. Thanks to our boy Jorge, translated in Spanish, Espanol. Yeah. So if when as we um, plan for our world domination, which you guys are going to help us out with by going to my stories and leaving your email and doing the survey, um, we will have that in print hopefully in the next year or so as we start to infiltrate the fitness culture in South Central America. We actually have a decent throw. Uh, um, uh, mainstay in Spain. Uh, shout out Luca. Who else do we have that's Spanish? I know we get, we get a handful every semester from Spain, obviously English speaking for now. But uh, yeah, L1 coming to you live in Spanish. We have a few other second languages. Did we figure out Jordan Co? Shout out Jordan Co if you're out there. What what dialect of Chinese the manual is being translated into? I believe you know? Mandarin. 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 Right? Okay. Yeah, I don't I just have no idea. Yeah, I, we just, I don't know. Trust. I'm sure Jordan I just, knows. I hope so. I definitely, I have more faith in him. He's the most trusted of the three Jordans, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, all right. We, do we have any more bills to pay? Are we done berating them with L1? Yeah, L1's up for sale right now. Currently started, what, the 27th? So it would have been Monday of this week. Mm. Yeah, but you still hop in week one lectures. We have, you'll catch, uh, I believe you'll catch Killian's lecture if you register today. At the very least, you'll catch week one lecture by Jorge on Sunday. Even if you don't catch it, then registration usually stays open for the first couple of weeks after. So try and get in by Sunday. You can stay on pace. If not, all of your, um, all the lectures get saved and uploaded into your portal. So you'll be able to catch up on week one if you sign up next week. And we'll likely close registration soon after that. So PSL one. Head on over to www.predoscript.com and register. We'll see you in class. Now for the topic du jour, pressing mechanics. Sick. Hard transition. Hard, hard transition. Hard transition. Yeah. No, no smooth connection there. Um, where, because the, the nice part about 
the way this started and the way it continues to go is you have, I think, a unique perspective in the podcast space coming. I don't know of a high level Olympic weightlifter that has a podcast. You have to be it. That's yeah. I'm not sure if there is one, to be honest. You know why? Because they don't have personalities. Ah, that's true. A lot of them are cat people, weird socks. And I think that's their personality, Olympic weightlifting. You, you know what? It's weird. It's like, so I grew up playing hockey and like there's a, there's a, as a goalie, you know, I was a goalie, there's a trend between the better the goalie, the weirder the person. And it's like, you can always tell <laughs> who the backup is because he's like really social. Like, oh, you're not good. And that's, <laughs> that's great for you. But it's like you, honestly, if we think about in the world, the success of the podcast with how many millions of downloads we have. And yeah. yes, it's in, it's in the multiples of millions. Thank you. Uh, hold, hold for applause. And your relative skill level and ranking at Olympic weightlifting, you have to be the best pod, the best Olympic weightlifting podcaster on the planet. Uh, that using both those as qualifiers, I probably there's a, podcast it's more of a like patreon like paid subscription type thing it's called weightlifting house they put out a lot of good content but a lot of it is like weightlifting coverage it's not necessarily like conversational yeah educational i i know man it's it's a small world weightlifting coverage this just in third attempt oh my god boring dude i only i i watch when you lift and literally no one else yeah weightlifting if you're not like super into weightlifting, it's not fun to watch. And even if you are, like you can catch the highlights on Instagram and be just fine. That's yeah, it. That's, that's it. it. Not in the in between. And, and the, the formality of weightlifting, like the quiet on the platform, almost like the golfer esque sort of thing. It's like there's a certain amount of aggression that comes with lifting weights. And I, and I trust me, I, I, in the Olympics, I, I enjoy watching it just because of the sheer physicality of it. Like I think right. it is, in a lot of respects, uh, it is one of the purest ex- displays of human power that I think exists. Like, I don't think Olympic weightlifting should be called powerlifting by my definition of power, the way my brain looks at power. Right. Um, so I do enjoy it when it's, you know, every four, every four years is like my limit. That's fair. That's fair. I'll take yeah. that. Yeah. It's for very obsessive people, which I mean, it fits for me because I'm, I'm good at like three things and I just obsess over them. Like one is weightlifting. One is whatever the fuck we do, and I don't even have a third. I don't think I have a third. So I'm, I'm sure good you could pick things. stuff out of the stuff we do and make multiples, but it's really just one thing. Yeah. You could probably just stop it. Like, I really like lifting weights, and we could probably draw all the roads in your life back to that soul singularity. That's, that's exactly true. Yeah, so I just obsess over lifting weights, period. My point being, you offer a unique perspective of conversation, always have, always will. Thank you, sir. Uh, with the Olympic lifting background. And we're going to have a conversation today about mechanics of pressing. Yep. Because there's been an emergence of like, you know, in the biomechanics sphere around exercise programming <laughs> of the prevalence of no longer like chest and shoulder focused days, but push days, right? So push days seem to be a very common in vogue way to program upper body and you know it's a pressing plus accessory right so things that you move to away from the body so you this would commonly uh fall into the category of like triceps deltoids and obviously pecs now you know pushing in your world much different than pushing in the bodybuilding world but i think there's some immutable principles of biomechanics that need to be understood regardless of pushing whatever it is, however far it is, however fast it is. There's some really like some underlying things that'll help you assess like, Hmm, am I pushing effectively, whether it's for power, whether it's for muscle, a lot of times these things start looking pretty similar. If you can really understand and distill what it is you're looking at. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, I think weightlifting is almost just one step further than if we were to take powerlifting or hypertrophy training, because realistically, powerlifting and hypertrophy training look pretty similar in terms of the way a, a push workout might be organized or programmed. Um, just the difference in overload or the way that they will progress might be a bit different. But I think probably a lot of people are going to start with some sort of horizontal type push, something more 
skill oriented, less externally supported, and then move towards maybe some secondary push or press variation that will be externally supported so that they can push a little bit more output there and then start to move on to more isolated movements like like a pec fly, a tricep push down or a dip, and then getting into ice like delts, um, some delt isolation, which is kind of exactly the way I organize a, we'll call it a push workout or like a jerk workout, something where I'm go moving overhead. The only thing is I'm going to add the highest skill, most powerful component, that power output component first before all that. So the way that I'll organize a, a push workout for Olympic weightlifting, I'll typically start with, you know, you do all the warm up stuff. Um, the interest there is understanding how to create a stacked pelvis over rib cage. That's going to be the most important part of shoulder function, especially as you're going overhead, um, freeing up rotation through the scapula. So upward rotation, making sure that, that that's not inhibited in any way. Neither is individual rotation at the shoulder joint. Um, and then making sure that I can, I can coordinate all of that together, basically holding something over my head in a neutral pelvic position or a neutral lumbar position. So that's, that's warm up in a nutshell in a very non-specific way. But from there, it's going to be progressing into something. So overhead lifting or your push movements in Olympic weightlifting, uh, they're not very representative of strength. They're very representative of stability. So something like a jerk, like I can, I can split jerk a lot of weight, 170 kilos. Um, that's way more than I'll ever be able to press, even bench press. Even if I trained for a long time, I'll probably never bench press 170 kilos. I'm okay with that. But the difference there, the reason that I can move this weight overhead and lock it out and stand it up is because a jerk is an expression of a few things. First and foremost, core stability. You need to be able to maintain a stable enough core position to create force with your hips, your legs, push that force into the ground, get that return force back, transfer it to the barbell to lift it high enough that now you can create stable positioning by manipulating body position, not necessarily bar position underneath to a point where you can now stabilize and stand up. So that it, it's a very different emphasis than what most people think of when they think of a push workout. But the benefit to that, and I'm not saying everyone should jerk or everyone should even overhead press, but the benefit, if you are able to do that, is it shows a complete understanding of core stability, scapular stability, and glenohumeral stability. And there's an incredible transfer to that to, say, powerlifting, a output in a bench press, or hypertrophy training, being able to stabilize the shoulder complex for longer so you can have more meaningful reps in your output exercises. So something that I've noticed over the course of my, my training career is that as I have a greater capacity to put things overhead, there's also a positive reinforcement in other things that I'm doing in terms of pressing strength, in terms of my ability to create hypertrophy. So it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one correlation, but it shows that the, there is the potential there. If you're able to get into these positions and stabilize these positions well, that you can then be effective in other positions that are less demanding, that are not necessarily overhead positions. So that's that's the perspective i've taken on it and my training lately has looked a lot more like um like i'd call it general strength training with an underlying tone of hypertrophy and an underlying tone of olympic weightlifting so i still do olympic weightlifting on a regular basis but my overarching goal is it's strength it's it's to move more weight and i do that in various and different ways so so a push workout from i'm actually going to train push today I'm not even going to go overhead. This is this is like a, a very like hypertrophy or strength based push workout. I'll get to the gym. I'll do probably some cable pullovers, get into upward rotation of the scapula, create that neutral pelvic rib cage orientation, and focus on maintaining external rotation into that overhead plane. Cool. I won't spend too much time there. Then I'll move to something. Um, I really like the the cable like shortened range. Uh, press like a just a pec bias shortened range press um, again just to stabilize in that end range of of in that 90 degree in that horizontal plane um, of pressing that it's going to force me to create a little bit of protraction stabilize the scapula there and then moving towards 
my output based exercise. The good thing about the cable press, it's something you can't really load very heavy. So that's something I'm, I'm probably looking for, I don't know, maybe three working sets, 15 reps. And getting to the point where I'm getting some sort of stimulus, some sort of fatigue, I'm, I'm slowing down. It's challenging to get into end range, uh, challenging to get into that lockout there. Uh, but at the same time, it's I'm doing it with like, I don't know, 40, 45 pounds on a cable stack. Like it's, it's not going to make me very tired. Then I'm going to take that, that proprioception, that awareness that I've built there, and I'm going to transfer it over to something that is going to challenge me to coordinate the skill of a press. I like a dumbbell press. Um, and depending on how much time I have, how much I hate myself on that given day, uh, I'll probably go like a dumbbell bench press, probably again, three working sets of eight to 12 reps, trying to push loading there, and then move to some sort of like machine base, like a hammer strength incline press. Something's going to allow me to get a little bit more work in. Something that's pretty loadable, uh, but stability is not necessarily going to be a consideration there. And then after that, I'll, I'll, I'll move towards more isolation-based things. Like uh, I'll get into a length pack with a pec fly. And then uh, I've been liking like the, the hammer strength dip machine and an overhead uh, tricep extension. I like the contrast there in, in terms of scapular stability and scapular variability. Um, dip machine, you can load the fuck out of that thing. It's going to force you to create shoulder extension. You're going to get into more internal rotation of the shoulder, but the limiting factor is going to be scapular depression. How well can I hold scapular depression to allow me to output through the triceps? And then the contrast there, getting overhead is I need to be able to maintain scapular upward rotation to, again, be able to properly load the triceps uh, and, and get elbow extension overhead. So in terms of shoulder function, uh, those are two really good exercises for anyone that does want to get overhead. That can help you build the capacity to do so. Or someone who does train overhead, like I do, that can be something that allows you to increase your capacity to hold those positions in a very isolated, very focused way. Yeah, that, I want to bring something full circle because I think, you know, people are going to look at you, you know, split jerk, overhead push jerk, whatever, the, all the jerks all that you it. do, all of the jerking. A lot of jerking. And go, I can go like, oh, okay, but this doesn't really pertain. But it's if you follow kind of your train of thought, when people have issues with the overhead, they look at something, you know, as, as athletic as, you know, you throwing more weight that you can bench over your head, which is a pipe dream for literally anyone who doesn't train that specific, you know, modality, doesn't train Olympic weightlifting. The first thing you returned to when you built out this model was a ribcage and pelvis stack, right. right? And I think a lot of people, and this is true in the muscular development world, this is true of the, you know, the functional development world, however you want to, you know, categorize different means of lifting. Most people negate the relative position of the pelvis when it comes to overhead mechanics, right? Mm. So we can say the same thing about underdeveloped pecs that we could say about your pursuit in improving your overhead position. So regardless of pressing mechanics, our baseline is okay. Even if you don't necessarily have to, given the restraints of the particular movement of the muscles, you might be challenging coming from a bodybuilding slant. You need to have the option to be able to get overhead in a stacked rib cage position, right? The rib cage for better or for worse. And this is where it, it blows a lot of people's minds. And some people are reluctant to believe this. You can change the mechanics of the rib cage quite drastically and, uh, and quite quickly as well. If you know how to manipulate pressures under the rib cage, you can make these changes. And the concerning part is you can make these changes, which means if you don't know what the fuck you're doing, you can find yourself like really digging yourself further into a hole if you don't understand. So I think it's really useful when we start to talk about variability. And you mentioned two things after that that I thought were also equally as important. So it's like, okay, can you get overhead with a stack rib cage? Number one. And then number two, the next boss in this pursuit of improved shoulder function is can you get into hyperextension? Mm -hmm. Hyperextension is like a very lost art in shoulder function. And, you know, it, there's a lot of people just worried about the overhead, the overhead, the overhead, the overhead. It's like, ugh, sure. However, end range of anything is going to give you really detailed information. And when we have difficulty traveling through the sagittal plane, which is a flexion extension, or in this case, like hyperextension, 
it's very telling that we have some low hanging fruit that we can knock out and improve function very quickly. Mm-hmm. Someone starts to lack like, you know, a bit of internal or external rotation. It's like, okay, this could be a problem. That's like maybe a little bit more nuanced, but every time I see someone that lacks a certain level of internal and external rotation, which if we were to kind of bookmark this, if you're taking notes at home, you know, complexity of planes of movement progress from sagittal frontal to transverse. So when people look at, Oh, I don't have a lot of IR or ER in my shoulder. It's like, okay, that's a really downstream problem, right? That was what we refer to as a transverse plane problem. It's like, let's peel it back. Let's see how you move through the frontal plane. Like, can you move the rib cage through the frontal plane, right? No. Okay. Can you move the humerus through the sagittal plane? It's like, oh, wow. The, the limitation I'm seeing through the vector of internal and external rotation through the vector of the transverse plane is actually much more easier to perceive at the, if I just assess a limitation through the sagittal plane. And rarely, if ever, have I seen a limitation exist at the transverse plane. There's some specific cases of some high-end athletes, pitchers would be one, without a deficiency in the sagittal plane. So most people are going to really struggle flexion extension, getting into the hyperextended position, and then getting into the overhead position. And I prefer to use that order of things because the one of the one of the problems that the bodybuilding world has when it comes to accurately of diagnosing and intervening around shoulder function, more specifically shoulder function as it pertains to pressing mechanics, is when they lack overhead position, they immediately just try and improve their overhead position by trying to put their arm over their head. Like how, what universe is that a logical sequence of events, right? It's like you can't get there. Yeah, but if I just do it with weight, hold my beer or actually give me a heavy beer and I'll do a, a wide track raise with it. It's like, dude, are you out of your fucking mind? Like weight can resist muscles or assist a deviation in center of mass. In this case, it's doing none of those well, right? So if you grab a two and a half pound weight, it's not going to assist you in pulling you into this. Oh, I'm going to strengthen my lower trap. Not in a million years. You know how you're going to strengthen your lower trap by learning how to do a dip first. Because you know what their lower trap actually does? It doesn't do this Y MCA bullshit. It actually stops your shoulder blades from elevating. What's going to happen when we get to the like the starting position of a dip where our arms are at our sides, where I've never seen a single person struggle with the range of motion required to get their arms at their sides? Their arms are going to be at their sides at the start of the dip, and we're going to have to resist the traps from coming up towards the shoulders. right? So what's going to happen as I resist the upper traps from coming to my shoulders, my lower traps are holding that down. So I think a principle of pressing function as far as like we're just talking about pure assessment is like, can you get your arms behind you? Yeah. Right. And sometimes there's issues with that assessment because people don't realize that, look, in order to get your arms behind you, you actually need to be able to abduct your arms. Right. So if I get my arms right at my sides, I try to drive my elbows all the way to the back of the room and get my arms at hyperextension, front of my shoulder is going to roll forward. Right. And you, no matter how much you train or how much you stretch, that'll always be the case. But if I like abduct, I'm a little bit you know, there's a range between about 45 to 60 degrees. If I abduct to like 50 degrees for me, maybe 45 or 40 degrees for someone a little bit narrower, I get my arms behind me, no problem, right? So it's like, first, if we're going to assess someone's shoulder hyperextension, make sure that there's not a bone in the way. Make sure your scapula is actually not in the way. And that will be a really good point. And if it, if they can't get it into shoulder extent, hyperextension, that's a little bit of an easier problem to unpack. We can grade that because I can just take someone, oh, you can't get into... Uh, a dip position, a bottom of a dip position without excruciating pain. What if you just held the arm at your side? Oh, wow. Yeah. It's, I'm, and then introduce the mechanics. Either. Can you hold your arm at your sides with a, st- a stacked rib cage and pelvis? Immediately watch people get the speed wobbles. And you're just like, oh, well, hey, dude, you're trying to like dip you know, your body weight plus 90 pounds, 135, but you can't actually keep your lower traps from going right up to your, or your upper traps from going right to your ears with no weight in a stack position. Like that tells me that you're missing a lot of the underlying mechanics required to get in the overhead position. So that's kind of like thing number one and two. It's like, yes, when you get to the overhead position, it's like a buffer of function and you want to keep touching home base with it with any sort of exercise. Like I love that you talked about the overhead tricep extension. I think that's a great proxy for the overhead position for a lot of bodybuilders who might not be going into the overhead position with a press in some cases, or might not be going into the overhead position with uh, a barbell in most cases. But 
getting overhead and trying to get like a humerus that is perpendicular to the floor, that can be something that's super effective because if your elbow starts to hurt or your wrist starts to hurt or your shoulder starts to hurt, hey man, red flag. You know, this is a very, this is the probably the least loaded position that still effectively trains the muscle. So what I mean by that is like, you know, getting into that, over, that pure overhead position for the tricep is not going to be super beneficial if we're training the bicep. It's not going to be super beneficial if we're training the delt. And, you know, depending on the way you're training your lats, most guys aren't probably getting into the full overhead position in the way they train their lats, right? So it's going to be a unique exposure to a true 180 degrees humor. And if you start having issues there, it's like you're leaving a lot on the table as you bring that dysfunction down into planes more consistent with the muscles that you train, right? You said that, look, even though your push jerk is going to be way more than your bench press, you can still bench press more than someone who bench presses what you bench press but doesn't push jerk and who bench presses all the time. So these, once you, when you start to build these end ranges that expose your shoulder to dysfunction, and for those of you watching the podcast at home, I don't know what's happened to the weather outside. I feel like I'm doing this Blair Witch style. It got dark in here. Yeah, it's dark over there. Homie. I'm waiting for this, like the knife to come in and just jab me. <laughs> and I'm and I'm pray, I'm hoping. I'm really. I can yeah. use. Don't leave me, man. I can't I do this without you. All right, I'll, I'll fend off the fucking Mike Myers. <laughs> I don't even think I could fend off Michael Myers, the actor, right now. <laughs> now this Mexican shit got me. I'm loaded. Anyways, so. But you brought up an interesting point, right? So you work in the overhead. I would say that you work in more like exposure ranges of the shoulder, right? So in level two, we right. talk about exposure ranges. And you can bring a shoulder that's been exposed to greater levels and demands of internal muscular stability or function. And you can bring that into the realm of stable with you know, pushing horizontally. That person who's only ever trained or exclusively or disproportionately trained overhead and hyperextended positions where we have to use a lot of this internal stability and we really are reliant on positions and coordination and timing. You bring that into the wheelhouse of a bodybuilder, you know, 45 degree incline, horizontal press, 45 degree decline. That person is going to smoke the someone who's only trained those planes mm -hmm. that doesn't have that supported, uh, you know, function underlying a shoulder. So if you're a bodybuilder, you don't have to get into the overhead position. You don't have to do some of these more, you know, power movements. However, no, you do need to get into the overhead. You need to make sure that you can get there by any means necessary. Like, can you do an overhead tricep extension? Can you do, and this is something that I find myself prescribing to bodybuilders all the time, go on the assisted dip machine when the nice 55-year-old lady is done using it, and then you, at 8% body fat, who's trying to tell me that they don't have, you know, the shoulder mechanics issues, let's put the pin right at the bottom because you're super fucking weak where you, where you should be strong. And then just really grade the exposure of that hyperextension to a tolerance. Like there's no more of an eye opening moment to someone who is really more conventionally hypertrophy trained and doesn't pay much attention to joint mechanics they only look at muscular mechanics. There's nothing like sending them over to a dip machine and being like, go, like my shoulders are going to explode. Like, don't you think that's a problem? Like, don't you think that's a rate limiter? Like, do you think a shoulder that can't press itself up is a shoulder that probably can't grow as much muscle as it could? Like, don't you think that this may be the problem? Like that, the discrepancy in ability for someone that could curl their own body weight but can't do a dip with their own body weight. It's like, dog, <laughs> this is basic, basic shit. As far as your human body and the you know joint mechanics, or as I would refer to arthrokinematics are concerned, this is day one stuff. This to me, to coin a phrase, is when your strength has outrun your stability. You have this uncanny ability to exert force, but you have an absolute dog shit ability to resist force. Right? The thoughts of keeping their ears away from their shoulders at the top of a dip even with the full stack on, becomes a monumental task, especially when you start to cue with the mechanics that you started off this whole thing with. Can you do it with your rib cage stacked over your pelvis? You know what they're going to fall into? They're going to fall into their structure. They're going to extend on this dip machine, right? They're going to drive their sternum to the ceiling. They're going to have all this anterior expansion of their, of their abdomen. They're going to compress the shit out of their shoulder blades. It's like, no, 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 tuck that in. So I think that's two things off the jump that I think are really, really important. It's like, incrementally improve your overhead by starting with the low reach. And if you start with a low reach, 
make sure if you can't do it that you titrate your ability and strength and skill to a point where you can as that starts to happen once we get people doing body weight dips oh wouldn't you know it their overhead mobility improves right because we've trained the requisite scapula and ribcage mechanics to make that easy it's like studying for the test right when people try and put their arm over their head by just putting their arm over their head thinking <laughs> that that's going to work that's like studying practice tests you didn't actually learn the skills necessary to do that right it's kind of cheating you're not going to get anywhere that way i feel like my mother but if you start this this endeavor and i i prescribe dips in some capacity whether it's like bench dips iso hold with knees and hips at 90 degrees and i've done this for like i mean we did this together at combine you're taking world-class athletes and you're having them uh, unable to resist their own body weight. I mean, that's a fucking problem because not only you have to resist your body weight you have to resist someone else's and that someone else is fucking huge so those are two things out of the gate when we think about pressing mechanics like this is baseline shoulder function and the more we can attain this baseline shoulder function regardless of your pursuit however you're pressing whenever you're pressing however you're pressing you're going to press better if you adhere to some of these basic principles of the shoulder yeah absolutely and the way that I think about training for function, it's training for increasing your potential and potential in a lot of ways. Like if we now can you define like your mom, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to try to turn a light on. I'm listening. All right. All right. I'll be here talking. Um, so if we think of function through the shoulder, the ability to control the rib cage uh, over top of the pelvis, create core stability, the function to take the scapula through upward, downward rotation, um, and basically full flexion and rotation, flexion extension and rotation at the shoulder. That's the way I would define function. The, the ability to coordinate those things in the appropriate amounts, amounts in the appropriate positions. Now, that's going to give us potential in terms of force output. We're going to have a greater potential to create more force output. It's going to give us a greater potential in terms of options of exercises that we can take to a reasonable proximity of failure. It's gonna gr give us greater variability because we have more options. So in this session, uh, we can choose different exercises. We can have an A session, a B session. We can have greater variance throughout the week. So in terms of shoulder function for hypertrophy training, the better shoulder function you have, the greater potential you have to create a meaningful stimulus in terms of hypertrophy. Because you're just going to have more options in not only the way that you move, but the exercises that you can choose and your, your potential for force output. So I think that's something that, that gets lost in all of this because uh, a lot of the hypertrophy vein is focused around isolation training. Like you said, training a muscle, not necessarily training for function. So if we kind of put some importance on that, that means that maybe we can get more working sets at a heavier load for a, a compound movement. Awesome. There's going to be a great potential for hypertrophy there. Maybe we can add in an overhead tricep extension where now we're capitalizing on the hypertrophy gains we can get from being in a more lengthened position to that muscle. And we can tap into other, other vehicles of stimulus outside of just load. So it's actually going to decrease the amount of stress within a session increase the amount of stimulus that we're getting from it. So it's going to be easier to recover from. Uh, the, the simple fact that we have more variety or more variance within our sessions is, again, al going to allow us to recover from certain things while we train other things that are going to be similar or create a similar stimulus. So it's, it's really just going to increase the potential to be able to reach your end goal. And that's, that's the lens that I look through when I'm thinking about hypertrophy training is I'm going to have certain things in the program that are truly focused on whether it's output, isolation, training specific muscle, purely focused on those things. But I'm also going to have things in that program that are purely focused on function so that I can continue to perpetuate an increase in function around whatever I'm trying to do. And the thing about that for pressing mechanics is pressing mechanics are shoulder mechanics. Shoulder mechanics are, are not just pressing, right? So, so the things that I found most helpful in terms of increasing shoulder function. You already mentioned one of them is, is a dip or a variation of a dip, whatever that looks like. Being able to resist scapular elevation. A, a scapula that's elevated is not a stable position because gravity pulls downward. And if we're here, then inherently, we're going to eventually get here, whether we want to or not, especially if there's load in the equation. So 
so a dip is a great way to train that and get into shoulder extension, internal rotation. Um, I have, so there's two things. There's the dip and then a single arm overhead or degree of overhead uh, lat pull down. I think that's something where you're going to get to the other end of that spectrum where you're you're eccentrically loading. And that's an important component to this because we're always going to have a greater eccentric potential as opposed to concentric potential, like the Y rays that you mentioned, we're concentrically getting into the overhead position. And there's a lot of chances for things to go wrong, as opposed to if I'm eccentrically getting into that position, the load is pulling me into that position. It's assisting me to get into the position. So uh, an overhead lap pull down, it's eccentrically loading you through scapular upward rotation. Neutral grip is going to put a degree of external rotation into the equation. And that's something that as you can increase your potential to get through full range there, it's going to increase your potential to, or it's going to increase your understanding and your capacity to maintain structurally stable positions in the overhead position. So those two, I think, are, are probably the best two things you could do if you're looking to increase shoulder function. An honorable mention, and this is one um, that I've been leaning on heavily, is like a chest supported, like rear delt mid back uh, row variation. And the reason I really like that is because it's kind of that reciprocal relationship between rhomboids and serratus. You're getting that understanding of moving that scapula around the rib cage and the rear delts are an incredibly strong external rotator of the shoulder. So I think there's a ton of benefit to buffering your capacity to rotate through the delts so that you're not calling upon muscles that shouldn't have to do it. Like ironically, the rotator cuff, the rotator cuff's job is not to rotate you with a dumbbell overhead. The rotator cuff's job, its, its function is to keep that joint <clears throat> in place. So there's no ex, or there's no excess of say, uh, anterior, posterior translation as we're going through shoulder flexion. So joint centration is what that's, that's called is keeping those two bones centered upon each other. It's not necessarily a, a prime mover through rotation. The delts are. So delts have a great potential to maintain and take stress off of the rotator cuff as you're getting into that overhead position. So if I were to say three movements that you need to be training, if you want to increase shoulder function, it would definitely be a dip variation, single arm, overhead, pull down variation, and some sort of upper back, rear delt, focus row. Yeah, the, what I like about the rear delt, it really highlights the importance of looking at biomechanics through the lens of muscular mechanics, which is like everyone's main focus right now, which is great but only if it's a portal into the muscular mechanics, having a deeper understanding of the arthrokinematics of the joints that they cross. And then ultimately the third vector of biomechanics should be load management through exercise selection. So you've heard it here first, exercise selection, arthrokinematics, muscular mechanics is probably, if I were to coin another phrase, those are probably the three most prominent aspects of a biomechanical approach to training. Um, so we'll reference this episode in a few months. Just like saying. everyone's well, saying it. Right. But good. You know what? Fine. At this point, fuck it. You know what? Uh, I just hope I get to the point where I get to tell everyone just exactly what I think of them <laughs> on the podcast. Make sure <laughs> you go to my stories and leave your email address. No. Um, and what I like about the rear delt is, you know, we talk about the importance from muscular mechanics standpoint in the posterior fibers, the rear delt creating external rotation, talking about just the sheer ability to, you know, uh, to prioritize that muscle over our much less capable teres minor and infraspinatus. What I love about the rear delt is it is listed, and rightfully so, from an arthrokinematic standpoint, as a hyperextender of the shoulder. However, you need to understand that you need to achieve a specific degree of shoulder abduction to allow that hyperextension to occur. Mm -hmm. And you can visually qualify this by making sure that, hey, if my arm goes behind my body and I'm too adducted or too abducted, the front of my shoulder rolls forward as a consequence. And it's like, well, when that happens, we're now effectively training other muscles. And maybe we're using our long head of our tricep. Maybe we're using our lat. Maybe our humerus is just going there by extension of our shoulder blade moving. And then that would call into the mid traps and rhomboids. When you find that point of abduction between 45 to 60 degrees, depending on your shape and size, you got to understand that a shortened rear delt has to, and doesn't have to, but if we're training this for its you know, secondary tertiary property of not only you know, uh, um, improving muscle mass, but also improving movement quality at the shoulder, you have to respect the fact that if it's short, it 
should probably be in external rotation. If a muscle does something, when we say a muscle's action is this, we are referring to the movement that occurs at the joint during concentric orientation, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we are specifying others, we will say it eccentrically does this. So it concentrically creates external rotation, which is great. Find that sweet spot, pull that arm behind your body, have the moment arm of the cable be so that it's fairly alleviated at that point, and then suggest a little bit of external rotation. And the reason I like suggesting a little bit of external rotation in the shortened position it might not be advantageous to hypertrophy, right? Finding the fully shortened position doesn't really seem to be super beneficial for hypertrophy. However, fully shortened positions are really good at telling the skeleton where it needs to be to train a muscle, right? right? So then it allows us for that rear delt to start to control that eccentric internal rotation, which I love this principle where it's like, okay, rear delt fly, you should probably get it down to about 45 to 60 degrees. So that's why I prefer a single arm variation with a cable rather than the bilateral version that's sort of slapped on the inverse of a normal pec fly. So you're in a shortened position at 45 degrees abduction, let's say with a slight external rotation. As we come up, it's going to highlight another principle of arthrokinematics with the shoulder. Once you reach 90 degrees of shoulder flexion, your glenohumeral joint should be or has the ability to maximally internally rotate. So as you're coming up, you should uh, feel and allow for this passive event of internal rotation as your arm starts to you know, cross this 90 degrees of shoulder flexion. And then from there, and this is a key principle that I think might, might tie this whole thing together, is once I reach the point in which that internal rotation has occurred maximally at the humerus, I don't believe there's much benefit when it comes to the integrity of the AC joint in allowing that to go any further, which is to say, I don't really see the benefit of allowing now the internal rotation of the shoulder blade to allow the humerus to move further. Why? Because it's not like the rear delt is attached to the spine. We're taking that lengthened rear delt and just now bringing in the, you know, the rear or the rhomboids in the mid trap as the scap of the protract. While you're taking a very structurally stable joint, right, the, uh, the uh, uh, acromioclavicular joint, and you're rolling the acromion over the clavicle to get this big reach. It's like, no, dog, once your humerus gets in line with your body, that stops. Now, the hand might be a little bit in front of the shoulder if you're bending your elbow to decrease the moment arm in that fully lengthened position where the muscle is weak. But once we've facilitated this internal rotation at 90 degrees and our humerus is pretty much in line with our AC joint, then we move back into the fully shortened position, right? And as we move into hyperextension, we can allow our scap to retract and we can externally rotate to your heart's content and then we allow it to drift back up. So what I love about a single arm rear delt fly is in order to do it properly and effectively, you need to not just understand muscular mechanics. You need to understand arthrokinematics of the joint. You need to understand that, look, in order to get into hyperextension, my arm has to be abducted a certain level for that to happen without compensating through the anterior shoulder. And if I'm trying to finish the movement, I should be moving from external and shortened to internal at 90-ish degrees at, at lengthen. And I don't want to imbibe on the integrity of the AC joint by trying to get some arbitrary length in the rear delt that's not going to be there. Right? All we're going to do is just take that lengthened thing and just move it through space. And as we move it, we're just going to be taking that acromion over top of the clavicle, which, look, if you're deficient in range of motion at the shoulder, more specifically in internal rotation, you're probably already doing that a lot in your program anyway. If you're someone who has small, and, or small pecs and large anterior delts, this phenomenon is happening every single time you press. You're getting to the bottom, you're lacking internal rotation, your scapula starts to compensate because your humerus can't move in IR, your scapula moves in IR, you prioritize the delt over the pack. So lastly, I want to talk about impressing mechanics is that, is that proxy of hyper adduction, right? So whether it's shortening a pec, whether it's uh, you're lengthening a rear delt, you re whether it's doing close grip bench press, really don't have any business from a cost benefit standpoint of loading our hands inside of the point of our AC joint, right? So if you watch someone do, um, like a plate press or whatever that's called. like what eh, what are we doing here dog like obviously that one's an easy one to pick on but really when we think of the cost benefit of thinking we're getting a little bit more a length than a muscle like the rear delt which mechanically we're not in sacrificing the integrity of a very structurally stable joint if impacted or insulted in a negative way 
could be very, very difficult to unpack because the 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 AC joint's a lot more finicky than glenohumeral joint functional pathology. So if I'm thinking about, oh, I could squeeze out a little bit more length in my rear delt fly, like, well, you're probably not doing that. So that cost benefit ratio is off. Uh, or I'm getting my pec a little bit shorter. It's like, well, muscles don't really grow in the shortened position anyway. So that cost benefit is off. It's really not a lot, not a big reason why, or a good reason why you would want to cross your hands over. Oh, what about for rowing? It's like, okay, do it single arm. Get the scapula to move around the body so you don't have to lock in these bilateral AC joints, right? So that's sort of the last principle that I want to focus on is like, all right, the hand and the wrist. Let's go from the outside in. You started with the pelvis and rib cage going the inside out. Look at this. Off the cuff, wow. full circle shoulder storytelling. Fuck you like we haven't been doing this for <laughs> fucking seven years. So the wrist, keeping proxy on the wrist that we never find ourselves loaded inside the plane of the AC joint in any way, shape, or fashion. Right, like some of you might follow, I follow Sonny Webster online. Sonny Webster can do this crazy shit over yeah. him. Yo, did you know he's part Maori? He's what? He's, he's I don't know Islander. what that word means. His mom's an Islander. From Hawaii? Uh, Ma- I, maybe a Kiwi. No, uh, Fijian, Tongan, Samoan. Oh, shit. No way. That would make more sense on Yo, why his legs are so big. He's a fake white guy, dog. I feel <laughs> lied to. I love Sonny. I think Sonny's the man. And I watched him lift, and I was like, I look at my parents. I'm like, what the fuck? And then he's, he's like Samoan or Tongan or Fijian or, or some shit. Wild. He's yeah, I, I never would have guessed. like a white guy. Giving me hope. Dog, devastated. They yeah, keep me up at night. Sonny. Shout out, Sonny. Also, uh, a Porsche aficionado. <sighs> I know, yeah, man. I saw a Turbo S. Very nice. You got the pink one, too? You see that? Yeah, yeah, I can't. I can't sign off on that. But hey, man, it's, Sonny's you do doing you. Sunny, Sonny's doing Sunny things, man. The, yeah. the, the the pink is the the, the red tights of the car. Version, yeah, right? he's it out is. doing butt. It's, it's the backwards like, hat and went, on the platform. Yeah, he gets I get into it. the thing and he's in the overhead. He can get his hands inside the AC joints. But I wouldn't recommend it because no. there's a movement at the wrist called ulnar and radial deviation. There are very relatively sensitive structures at the wrist. And I don't use that word in the human body often, but it's true. Dealt with some pretty serious wrist injuries, not personally, but with clients and patients and athletes, they're motherfuckers. Yeah. Wrist, very structurally stable. Ton of ligaments, ton of bones, ton of joints, a ton of movement, hard to stabilize. Why? More movement, more thing, more opportunities for things to go wrong, more demand for that movement to have to be dynamically stabilized. When you start to add up, bring your hands in past the midline as described by the plane of your AC joint, you're going to have to start to compensate through ulnar and radial deviation. Anyone in the CrossFit world, anyone in the Olympic lifting world, anyone who's bench pressed really heavy incorrectly is might experience, you know, triangular fibrocartilage issues with the triangular fib- fibrocartilage is on the medial aspects. So if you follow your pinky down to your wrist, there's just this little divot here. This movement here is called ulnar deviation, right? If I have to deviate my wrist outwards because I'm in the bottom of too close of a press, like a, I don't know, like a diamond push-up or a, clo- a close, close grip bench press, we've come into now yet another a negative return on a cost-benefit ratio. It's like, should we be, are we maximizing muscle recruitment by having a press here? Probably not. If anything, we're decreasing elbow flexion and extension because my hand's running into my chest. Right. If my hands off to the side and now all of a sudden this deviation goes away, my wrist position normalizes, my elbow goes into my shoulder should go into a little bit more hyperextension, allows my elbow to go into a little bit more flexion, which allow my tricep to get a little bit more length. Right. So when this is, again, arthrokinematics, dog, wait for it. Six months. I can't wait to see it. I can't wait. And look, I'm okay with that. I've accepted the fact that RX radio writes 90 percent of people's captions. That's good. Just, hey, if you're going to rip it off, don't fuck it up. Don't try to run a business out of it either. Yeah, you know who you are. You know who you are, motherfucker. <laughs> that's right. That's fucking right. Well, we don't play. Don't play. Uh, but no, seriously, like, think of, think about it. Like, when you learn, our, which is something that, it's funny, I've, I've been doing some stuff at Cairo schools lately. Because the PS level, level 1 course is accredited by PACE, which is a continuing education provider for chiropractors in the United States for CEUs. Are you a chiropractor tired of doing the <laughs> dumbest fucking CEUs on the planet? So fucking dumb. Hit us up. We got you. We got you. 
So yeah. free script coming out to live Cairo students, Cairo's tell your friends, California and New York were coming over by the end of the semester. We should have it all done, but most of the other States in the States, we got you covered and we'll have you guys covered. And one of the things I tell Kairos all the time, because I sit in a room with these kids at Logan, at CMCC, at Palmer Davenport, the biggest schools in the profession. And they go like, we all, like, you don't seem to practice like a normal Cairo. It's like, you guys are missing the point. You have access to the one thing that no one else has. You should have a very, very intimate understanding of arthrokinematics. And they don't even know what the fucking word is. It's like, guys, joint mechanics. Like no joint mechanics and you can superimpose muscular mechanics so easy. They fall victim to joint mechanics. Your muscles can't move outside of a plane where bones will not let it. Right? So if you learn that and you can wield it, holy shit, you're pretty much have to learn some exercise programming and load management, which I think if you if you're diligent, you and can follow up and take, you know, and track progress is the easiest part. Right. Are you getting stronger? Yes. And the program by the definition is right and working. Are you not? No, the program is now wrong and we need to figure out what's what what we need to change. So it's like if you know joint mechanics as a chiro at every joint, at the ankle joint, at the tibia, at the, at the knee joint, at the, at the patellofemoral joint. If you know all muscles are easy. That's why dumb people study them. <laughs> Joints are hard. They're harder. But when you man, you're so powerful when you understand how the two things work together. Right? And biomechanics is how the muscles play with the joints, and then that interaction plays with itself over time. Feel like a crazy person, dog. Feel like a crazy person. Yeah, well, did it. that was good. That was good. Fuck yeah. I'm happy. <laughs> Our ability, to, we can, so you know how like some people on Instagram, and I'm getting good at this, like I can hit a minute in my head on a timer that doesn't exist. J Marsh throws the camera up. Me and you hit the hour mark in a pod. Next level. Ooh, perfect. It's perfect. 101, 102. Easy days. Okay. So to recap, if anyone is still listening, listen to all of the episode again if you need to hear the technical stuff. But we need a favor. Go to my stories. You putting this up? I'll put it up. Red, white, and Jordan. That's right. Go to – it was white spelt wrong. W-I-T-E. Red, W-I-T-E. And Jordan, J-O-R-D-A-N. Not Y-N, not O-N. A-N, like a man. That's right. And then go to our comment boxes and just leave your email. We will send you an email in the next week with something that we need help with. We need to access your brain collectively. We need the RX Radio Brain Hive to help push the industry forward. And trust me, when we're done with what we're doing, you'll be like, holy shit. These motherfuckers pulled it off. And you'll be on my no shit talking list. Yeah. That's anything for him. Well, I'll defend hey, you. Just take it, <laughs> take it as endearing, unless it's not. That's why I'm taking it. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, anyways. Love you, brother. All right. Good love you, too. All right, guys. We'll see you next week. Appreciate it. Head over to the question box on our Instagram stories. If you miss yeah. this episode, you catch it later in the week, shoot us a DM. We'll get your email on that list. Super important. If you have friends in the industry, you work at a gym, you're in and you want to push this thing forward. We're doing some crazy shit. We're the only founder-led company in the industry that's ever done what we're about to do. Money where your fucking mouth is, bitch. That's what we're all about. And this is the difference between people that do sound bites and podcasts and people who do an hour off the cuff. We're about to make it real. So appreciate it. We'll talk to you guys soon in the emails. Appreciate you guys.